we have now been at this for several months where every Wednesday we bring together partners and talk about some facet of kids, families, and COVID. So you'll remember we have tackled issues like child welfare, K-12, uh, economic recovery, uh, justice, and the list goes on. We've had the Lieutenant Governor, Secretary Friedlander, had uh, key educators uh, talk about uh, the reopening issue. So we're, we're trying to keep this as pertinent and current as possible. Uh, I also, Jesse, wanted to remind our, our attendees that I understand that uh, there are some press members on this call, including Spectrum News. Uh, again, uh, we're muted. Uh, we're going to ask questions, but we just want you to everybody be aware of everybody on the call. Uh, I do want to do a tease. And uh, when you get into hypotheticals, it's always dangerous. But I, I asked Jesse for permission and she gave it to me. Uh, I have good reason to believe that pretty darn soon we're going to have a DCBS commissioner named by Governor Bashir. And in fact, I'm going to make a prediction that the brand new DCBS commissioner is going to be our guest next Wednesday. So whether it is early childhood and child care, uh, child welfare, uh, protection, uh, abuse and neglect, Medicaid eligibility, Veterans Affairs. I mean, you know that's a $1 billion with a B, a $1 billion office within CHFS. Uh, I would encourage you to think about that we're, we potentially will have that new leader with us next Wednesday and begin communicating today as to what issues should we tackle what questions would you like to ask and help us architect the very first public conversation with that brand new commissioner next Wednesday? So I have a feeling you'll receive communication from Jesse about that, but I, I did want to give that as a tease because I know so many of you, uh, uh, your core issues uh, are in the DCBS world, and we wanted to make sure you were aware that that uh, we think we have a good shot. At, we think our prediction is correct, and we think we're going to have that person next week. So that's sort of a, a tease, I believe they call it, in the medium. Uh, today, uh, we are so pleased to have three terrific guests to talk about the important issue of returning to work uh, through the lens of moms and dads and kids. Joining us are Clinicia Coleman. Clinicia has been with the Boys and Girls Clubs of Kentucky Anna for more than eight years. She serves as the site director at the Shawnee location in Louisville. And from KYA's perspective, she is such a valuable partner uh, in connecting us with Youth Voice, uh, putting us in a position where we can really hear from families uh, around the kitchen table, so to speak. So uh, she really has that vibe for that on-the-ground work that is so important. Ashley Watts is president uh, and CEO of the Kentucky Chamber of Commerce. Uh, she uh, has been at the chamber for a while and is relatively new to this role as CEO. Uh, more than half of Kentucky's workforce is employed in a business represented in the chamber. And uh, what we have found, Ashley, uh, a valuable partner on a number of issues ranging from child care to the K-12 uh, arena. And so, uh, Ashley, we always appreciate you being here with us. Uh, the third guest is Bill Londrigan, and Bill is the president of Kentucky State AFL-CIO. Uh, that is the largest labor federation in the Commonwealth. It has more than 100,000 members. And I think Bill will tell you very rarely is he on anything that he doesn't get a note from me saying, thanks, you really made me think about X, Y, or Z. So he's one of the most thoughtful cats out there uh, in terms of raising what I call cerebral itches. And I appreciate that uh, uh, a t tendency that you have, Bill. Uh, we all know that as part of COVID's uh, unprecedented impact, the issue of workforce uh, and the economy is large in people's minds. And we know that you can't separate workforce and kids. Uh, there's a reason Ashley off camera 
was talking about that the chamber allows employees to bring kids to work one day a week uh, just to kind of make things a little bit more doable. We also know that you can't talk about workforce without recognizing inequities. Inequities by zip code, inequities by race, inequities by profession, inequities by income. I mean, it is a platform where folks who are under-resourced or have resources, that plays out so differently depending on who you are. So our goal today is to get perspectives, three very different perspectives from folks around what does it mean in their world for folks to return to work? How are we gonna take care of kids? And what should we as a Commonwealth be concerned about both for the kids, for businesses, and for our brothers and sisters in the workforce? So facilitating the conversation today is our COO, Patricia Tennant. Patricia, I'll kick it to you and you can take it from there. Thanks, Terry. Um, and Clonisha, Ashley, and Bill, thank you so much for joining us today and to everyone else on the Zoom. Um, it's, um, I'm excited to have this conversation with you all. Um, Clonisha, I'd like to start with you um, and ask first, just quickly, could you give us a quick overview of the mission of the Shawnee Boys and Girls Club um, and let us know, you know how has that changed during the pandemic? Um, sure. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so um, thank you, Terry, for that wonderful introduction of uh, myself. So I am with the Shawnee Boys and Girls Club. I am one of the three Boys and Girls Clubs here in Kentuckyana. Um, we also have Newburgh Boys and Girls Club and Parkland Boys and Girls Club. Um, our mission actually is also on our uh, <laughs> wall behind us, our mission statement, so our kids can see it as soon as they walk in. Um, and I know you can't see it, so I'll read it off to you. Um, the mission statement is to inspire and enable all young people, um, especially those most in our need of services, to realize and develop their full potential as productive, responsible, and caring citizens. Okay, so that is a mission statement from BGCK. Um, but also, I'm always serving our community, although some businesses um, and nonprofits close their doors. Boys and Girls Club stayed open. Although we do not have kids in the building, I'm still serving parents and kids on a daily basis from 4 to 5.30 to serve Kids Cafe. We are a site for Dare to Care. Um, so a lot of those concerns and things that parents are facing, um, when I meet them at the door, they, they voice those concerns. <laughs> and we have chats and reports to those things. Um, I do want to say that a lot of the um, can I go ahead and go into the concerns facing parents? Is that okay? Yeah. Or? Yes. That's, that okay. was my next question was because okay. we know you do have that interaction. Give us a sense of what the concerns are. Okay. Um, so right now, one of the biggest concerns is child care um, from our parents. Um, although daycares have opened their doors since the 15th, um, they are still concerned in regards to allowing their kids to come to child care. The reason being COVID-19. Um, us Boys and Girls Clubs will be opening July the 6th, um, and I will be the first to open out of all three clubs. Um, in addition, the other two clubs will follow me a week after. Um, so we are opening with, you know, uh, precautions making sure that we have everything outlined for our parents to know exactly what we're going to do to make sure, or to ensure that our, that our kids are safe um, as the best way possible. But I've actually had parents who said they're not comfortable with having their kids come regardless of what we have um, as far as masks and hand washing and sanitizing and tend to a room and things like that. Um, we are trying to make sure that um, our parents have all those questions asked, but to be our way honest, um, we can try to limit as much as we can, um, but it's still real. COVID is still real and still, <laughs> still uh, alive and well. Um, so a lot of those concerns come from parents as far as being able to um, release their kids into a facility, um, although they do have to return to work. Now, a lot of those parents are saying, you know, I need to return to work, but should I? because the same things come up in the workforce. Although we 
um, work organizations and businesses are making sure that they are doing what they need to do. There's still those concerns um, from parents and I'm a parent myself. Uh, so I can understand and I've had talks with parents to say, you know, they're asking me, um, you know, what, what steps are you all taking to ensure that our kids stay safe? You know, and these are real questions that I'm getting from real parents. Um, and all I can say is that I'm trying my best. Um, so we can only accept 50 kids in our building, which also brings about, you know, the, the opportunity or the capacity to uh, fulfill grants, to fulfill those numbers, you know, so it's, it's a lot more to that. Um, I've also had parents to experience domestic violence during this time, um, which is, you know, a, um, a hard topic to talk about and to bring about. Um, but as you all know, that um, domestic violence has skyrocketed, um, especially because people are at home. You know, those opportunities that parents had to leave the home to go to work, um, you know, it's, it's been hard and it's been, it's been rough. Um, I also had um, an organization that I'm partnered with to go to a home of a parent um, who had their window broken out because of domestic violence. And they up for free. You know, um, I really feel like what makes our parents thrive here um, at the Boys and Girls Club and other organizations that can help um, during these times is um, being a resource. You know, what I cannot provide, I'm asking other people to provide for my families. Um, depression, anxiety through these times also is something that our parents have um, expressed. Weight gain, you know, um, just that that balance, trying to find that balance in the midst of everything that's going on, especially um, with everything going on as far as um, um, equity, you know, trying to get everybody equal um, in regards to discriminations, <laughs> you know, everything that's going on in regards to um, cop brutality and police brutality and things like that. So um, it's a lot. Um, there's another concern that I seen someone that um, had commented in the group chat in regards to the reopening of schools. That is another concern. Um, I really have not heard anything about the plans for that. And I don't know if anyone will be able to answer that in the further discussion, but um, mm -hmm. I have parents concerned in regards to schools opening up for their kids. Mm -hmm. uh, if they do return to work, you know, depending upon how JCPS is, yeah. is uh, you know, their hours There's and they're going to do yep. things mm -hmm. can create another issue. You mm -hmm. know, the return to work, do they have to leave work once again to secure childcare and be home? You know, um, yep. so that's an issue. Um, a lot of uncertainty. A lot of uncertainty, yes. Yeah. Um, a, a a, of one more. Yes. And another thing that our parents are facing, um, and I myself personally, being that our kids have not been able to have a safe place to go to, um, to keep their minds occupied, um, to keep their days filled. Um, I lost a teenager a month ago um, to gun violence. Um, yes, he was a teenager, he was 15, um, and he was gunned down multiple times in the alley. So during this time, there has been a, a, a lot of, a lot of issues. Um, keeping our kids safe. You know, a lot of the kids that I would have in here, this is the only place that they have to go. We're an after school program, you know, mm -hmm. so keep those kids off the street and things like that. The only thing that I can do really right now is to offer um, resources. We're doing, uh, not only are we doing Kids Cafe for Dare to Care, but we we're, we're also have a lot of resources right in the middle of my cafeteria over here where I have boxes of food, canned goods, gift cards, things like that to um, in some effort to help our families and our parents. Um, and I just want to say that, you know, a, one more concern is that our parents are worried um, about having a lot of those resources still available. The reason I yeah. say that is because it's so easy, and this is, this is my opinion, and this is the voices of my parents. It is so easy to come together um, when there's a crisis, right? Mm -hmm. But what happens when the crisis calms down, the pandemic is over? What happens to all those resources? 
we need to make sure that those resources are always available for our parents and our children, not just in times of crisis, right? Mm. Um, but they want to sure those resources are still available even after this. So that, mm. that's some of the concerns that my parents are facing right now. Thank you, Clinicia, um, for setting that stage. I think that's uh, what we need to hear that. We need to continue hearing that. Um, th and thank you for being that advocate um, and for uh, being the link to the resources currently. Um, and that's really helpful to set, uh, set, set us with some reality. Um, I know, you know, I'm very mindful right now uh, as a parent of two, I'm at work. Um, yeah. So this is uh, this discussion today about returning to work, you know, or, um, you know, for it, it's, I, it's not something I'm personally dealing with. Um, and the, the safety issues, the childcare concerns, um, all of that is very real. Um, so I'd like to now turn uh, to Ashley and Bill um, and invite you, if you could uh, first give us a couple sentences, tell us about uh, your mission and vision and what your, um, and why you care about kids and families. Thanks, Patricia. Uh, and thanks, Clinicia. That was great information. Uh, we, uh, the Kentucky Chamber of Commerce is the largest business organization in the state. And we have been very involved in childcare for many years, really for various reasons. One obviously is the impact that childcare has on the workforce of today. Um, and Terry mentioned earlier, uh, I am president and CEO of the chamber, but even more so important, I am a mom of two. So I have a four-year-old and a seven-year-old. And right now, Wednesday is chamber camp day. That's what we've designated it. And so every Wednesday, everyone's mostly working from home. But as we all know, sometimes it's nice to get in the office and kind of work in the office for a little bit, especially uninterrupted after three months of quarantine. And so we at the chamber worked with our attorney and made sure we were kind of in the safety guidelines to do so. But we hire a couple of babysitters and they, you know, the children of the chamber can stay here on Wednesdays and let their parents work. So it's one of those creative ways that businesses have really kind of had to adapt to this new reality. Um, but one obviously is the impact to the workforce of today. So the chamber obviously was, was excited uh, last month when business started to reopen in a safe, methodical way. And however, with that came the question of employees are being called back to work, which is great. Um, they're going to get their jobs back and their salaries back, but yeah, they have children at home and there's nowhere to take them. And so the timing of that was very difficult for many of our uh, workforce here in Kentucky as well as our employers. And then really kind of an overarching goal of why the chamber cares so much about quality childcare is that it's setting the foundation for the next generation of workforce. And so as we all know, and I'm sure you guys on the call probably more so than I do, that the brain develops faster in those young ages than any other time in your life. And so we have to make sure that we we have that strong foundation um, as a state that we are building up our next generation of workforce. And I think it's very important when we talk about childcare, you know, it's not just babysitting. There is a lot more that goes into it than just babysitting. And so, you know, for children to have that gone, you know, several months without that, it's going to be very interesting to see kind of what the outcome is after that. And then obviously, you know, childcare here in Kentucky is a, it's a small business industry. Um, we have thousands of childcare providers all over the state, and we have recently done a survey that shows that about 42% of childcare uh, facilities here in Kentucky may not make it out past COVID-19. Um, because they were shut down for so many months and, you know, they operate on very, very little. I mean, there's not a large margin of profit for most of our child care providers. And so 42% may not actually be here to serve our children and our families once we are out of COVID-19. And when you break that down into numbers, that's 56,000 Kentucky children that will be left without quality child care. And so we have really been saying there's lots of obviously implications that once we come out of this in terms of the economy and workforce and the state budget, and we can talk all about that. But one of the main things that we think we really are gonna to need to focus on is this issue that we will not have enough childcare quality or quality childcare. We know that our childcare system is a fragile system as it is in Kentucky. Um, we all know about childcare deserts where there are many parts of the state that do not have access to quality childcare. And as has been in this pandemic, 
those inequities have really been heightened because of COVID-19. And so we really have been strong advocates the last couple of months to support our child care providers across the state for a multitude of reasons. But we hear from employers every single day saying, you know, we need to bring our employees back. We want to get things back up and running and get them back on the payroll but they still have children at home and there's just really no way we can. And so it really is a difficult situation and Clinicia brought up the fact of school as well. We are also hearing from employers every single day saying, do you know what's happening with school? Because if school doesn't reopen or if it opens three days a week, that's gonna change the entire look of the workforce across Kentucky. And so the more that we can have this kind of dialogue and bring the employer community into it, I will say, you know, 68% of people that we surveyed, our businesses have said, they want to be as accommodating as possible when it comes to child care. They will be flexible. They'll do things like I call chamber camp. They'll let people work from home. And it's wonderful to have employers like that. But the reality is sometimes that's just not applicable. If you're working in a restaurant or a retail facility, you can't really bring your child to work. And so it's figuring out those connections. But there's still a lot of unknowns. But I think the one thing that I want to make sure that we are all aware of is how fragile the child care system is and how, you know, in just a short couple of months, we may be looking at half of the child care centers in Kentucky closing down because of this. And so we have been advocating very strongly for additional CARES Act dollars or additional federal funding to go to these child care centers. Um, one tangible way is that they're on a reduced ratio, obviously, because of safety precautions. And we all understand that. But when you do that at a child care center, they're really, it's going to cost them money to operate. And so how can we get those ratios back up in a safe way and making sure that everyone is still going to remain, remain safe. So I, you know, everyone I think is on the same page with this. We all want the best outcome, but it's how do we all work together with child care providers and advocates and the business community and state government to really make sure that we are upholding the system that not only is serving our children of today and our workforce of today, but this is really a foundation that if we don't get this right and if we don't fix this, it's going to have ramifications for years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. And I think you're um, spot on <laughs> that uh, this was an issue before the pandemic um, and that is really um, hitting home now um, and we uh, appreciate your advocacy on that. Um, Bill, I'd now like to turn to you um, and hear a little bit about your mission, um, the connection with kids and families and you know what are some of the concerns of your members as they return to work that you'd like to lift up? Okay. Uh, yeah, of course, our mission is to uh, improve the working and living uh, standards of the uh, people of Kentucky, uh, union members and, and everybody that works for a living. Uh, that's our primary. Uh, our children, by virtue of the fact that with families, it's, uh, they all go together. So on that note, uh, you know, this obviously is a issue that is uh, probably we've never faced before. And it's something that is so uh, monumental. I think we get that from what Ashley said and Kanisha. There's uh, these uh, changes that are going on that are going to be with us uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, as, you, as you probably realize. And uh, we are trying to make adjustments uh, to the actual way people, people work, interact with their workplaces. And you know, uh, the workers and people that uh, you know, we interact with and, and represent you know, are under a huge amount of stress. Uh, that, that's one way to say it, that they're, uh, you know, very stressed and there's a lot of anxiety, uh, particularly in the situation where people have to care for their children and uh, not be able to go to work. Uh, that has raised so many uh, problems for folks. And now with the reopening, we have people that are being put in untenable situations and almost being uh, asked to decide whether they want to stay home and, and raise their family or, or have a job. And that is a, a choice that they should not uh, be required to make. Uh, and I, Ashley, of course, said that, you know, accommodations can certainly be made, uh, but there's much more involved here. There's a opportunity for us to incorporate paid uh, leave for folks, uh, make sure that they can maintain their, their family uh, while they're trying to uh, get through the COVID-19 and, and get people back to work in some, some manner that 
they are not being asked to, you know, make that choice between, uh, you know, t raising their families. And we have people that have actually, you know, had to quit their jobs uh, in order to uh, c continue trying to take care of their, their families and their children at home. Uh, so we, we have a real problematic situation. Uh, Ashley mentioned child care. You know, we have child care that is on a uh, certain hours right now, and we've got workers that don't work those hours. So we've got mismatch in between, you know, when people can actually get any child care uh, and when they've got to go to work. Uh, so there are so many, you know, factors that are involved. And, you know, we think that we've got a legislation that, that is helpful with the HEROES Act, uh, you know, gives some more uh, opportunity for employees to claim tax credits for folks when they get family medical leave. We have, you know, opportunities for us to expand those programs. Uh, to make sure we're protecting people and making sure that they can maintain their standard of living in their, uh, you know, uh, their families and their, uh, to put food on the table uh, while they're in this uh, very, very, uh, you know, problematic and, and stressful situation in terms of how they're, you know, being required to uh, take care of family as well as trying to keep a job. And, and that is really, uh, you know, a, a difficult situation. Uh, I, there are obviously some efforts being made that I think are, are laudable and, and should be pursued. And, uh, uh, you know, paid family, uh, paid leave uh, for folks is, is absolutely essential. Uh, we need to make sure that we have uh, the opportunity for people to keep uh, food on the table. And uh, so, so there's a lot of stuff involved with how we approach this. And, you know, the HEROES Act, which is, uh, you know, uh, House Resolution uh, uh, 6800, uh, which is before the Senate now, I think uh, has elements in it that will help protect folks and make sure that they're protected under the Family and Medical Leave Act and also provide some additional tax credits for employers along those lines. So the things that are, you know, being proposed are, are positive, uh, but certainly not uh, going to be absolute remedies to uh, the situation people are in to try and, protect, you know, have their families, uh, you know, uh, taken care of as well as maintaining their employment. So there's obviously a, a real mismatch here. And, and you kind of got ahead of me there, Bill, because that was going to be my question really was then to think about that role that uh, public benefits play. I think with this kind of deep economic uh, issues, uh, a lot of people have had um, had to rely on them, um, probably that for the first time. And, um, you know, with the increased unemployment insurance uh, that came through the federal provisions, um, we are hearing that a lot of uh, low wage workers actually might be uh, making more. Um, for instance, with childcare, we know that was the case after being laid off. Um, so I'd like to open it up to um, the panel, what's your thought on that? How is that going to play out if uh, going back to work, um, you actually make less and put yourself in a dangerous situation? Can I just uh, respond to that quickly? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that notion that, you know, people are somehow or other, you know, benefiting over and above what they're due, uh, I think, because you know, uh, if you realize it, they make a whole lot less money on unemployment than they do when they're working. I mean, that's the vast majority and, and really the fact uh, of the situation. Uh, you know, people that are offered their work back, uh, most people want to work, uh, but they don't want to work in an unsafe situation. They don't want to be put back into a factory or a plant where the employer has not really taken the steps necessary to protect them and not have personal protective equipment, uh, you know, not have social distancing and, and things of this nature that we all accept as, as you know, wearing masks is, is one of the things to protect folks. So uh, it's one of those situations where uh, people, you know, should be uh, uh, not put in a situation where they have to go back to work in an un unsafe environment. And uh, the safety net is there for a reason and it, and it needs to be expanded. The uh, HEROES Act actually uh, puts forth the uh, additional federal money till the end of December. Uh, this isn't over by any stretch and people are still hurting and, and they need this support right now. And just on the other side of the equation, let's just talk about all the trillions of dollars that in tax breaks that large corporations have got. So when we're talking about a safety net for workers, let's not forget that the other side businesses, the wealthy have gotten way more than their fair share of tax breaks and credits and, and additional wealth uh, during this time frame. So uh, let's let the workers have at least some benefit and some uh, cushion here while they're trying to maintain their families. 
Yeah, and, and, and from the Chamber's perspective, as the, as the employer community, you know, we were very supportive of the CARES Act. We were very supportive of the enhanced unemployment insurance benefits. We were very supportive of the stimulus. And, and not only does that keep all of our workers and families, you know, be, being able to maintain, hopefully, during the COVID-19 impact, it also helps the economy. You know, we want to make sure that we're not going to go into this long-term recession. And as long as people have some sort of income coming in or have that stimulus money or have that unemployment insurance, they can continue, you know, to be able to pay their mortgage and buy groceries and all those things that are necessary when, you know, the economy was shut down to no fault of anyone's own. And so I do think, you know, we have heard stories of, you know, some people do make a little bit more during this than they would normally, like in the childcare sector. However, we do know this is a short period of time. And, you know, that, that's the key is that this is not forever. This is a short period of time, kind of this bridge to get them to where they need to be. And so I think it was a very, very needed step that needed to happen, um, not only in terms of making sure that everyone is, is as whole as they can be and can take care of their family, but also it helps the overall economy, which I think we all can agree is what, you know, we need to have happen. So, but it is an interesting discussion on kind of next steps, uh, because I do think there is some concern of, you know, if, how long does this go and how long right now the enhanced unemployment insurance expires July 31st, unless additional approval is given by Congress. Um, and what mm -hmm look like? Will businesses be reopened? How many businesses will have been closed down, you know, long term or even permanently to where people don't have jobs to go back to? And so a lot of it is unknown, but I do think well, hopefully most everyone can agree that the precautions and the safety net kind of, as Bill said, that has been, you know, done thus far has been very needed. And I said, this is a, this is something that we had never encountered before. And so we had to take steps that had never been encountered before. Um, but we, I do agree with Bill, you know, we know that this is not a short term issue. We do know that there may be another spike in the fall and how that, how that affects everything. But I do think there's also a balance of how do we somehow keep the economy going and somehow keep the, the jobs going and employers open because the tax base, right? I mean, if we don't have jobs and we don't have employers, there is no money to go into the tax base. So, I mean, it's a delicate balance, but I do agree with Bill also that, you know, employers, I have said this for many, many weeks now, it is our responsibility. The onerous is on us to make sure that employers, or employees, patrons and customers feel safe in our establishments. Um, it has been three months of kind of lockdown. We know kind of what, you know, the, the precautions we need to take. And so I don't think any of us want to protect any kind of bad actors. I mean, the onerous is on the businesses to get the PPE, to do the social distancing, to make us feel as safe as possible at work, much like childcare. I dropped my son off at karate camp this week. He has never taken karate, but they offered a camp this week, so I signed him up immediately. Um, but they, you know, were taking temperature checks and masks and social distancing, and you can't bring your lunchbox. You have to bring a disposable bag. But it made me, as a parent, feel better about sending him into this environment, right? And it's the same mm -hmm. Employers. I mean, I think we, whether you're a large manufacturer or you're a small office or you're a nonprofit, you have to at this time make your employees and your patrons and your customers feel safe and comfortable because if you don't, they're not going to patronize you. They're not going to bring your business to you. Um, so the owners, I really think, is on us to make sure that happens. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. And, you know, another thing I uh, have to think about is we were aware before of the benefits cliff. Um, which, you know, a situation where if a, a parent would get a raise or a promotion, um, they would suddenly lose their benefit. And that was particularly drastic with childcare. Um, and so that loss could suddenly put them in a crisis situation. Um, and so I'm wondering, is that part of the conversation um, as we think about, you know, the enhancements to make sure that there is a ramp off um, that we are not um, putting families in greater crisis by suddenly um, taking away that net. Could I just uh, respond to that very briefly? Uh, you know, when we talk about that, I think the, the really the overriding issue is health care and that the loss of health care uh, when, when workers, lose, you know, are laid off or lose their employment, that attachment to the health care, to that employment uh, creates extreme problems when you have millions and millions of people now unemployed. Uh, the, the HEROES Act uh, actually increases the 
time frame for which people will be eligible to get COBRA benefits and uh, pay at least, I think, 100% of the, those benefits for an additional six months or something in that range. So uh, that there's something positive there uh, in that regard, but that uh, obviously doesn't uh, you know, address the overall problem of that uh, attachment of, of healthcare benefits and insurance uh, to employment uh, uh, based. Uh, so when people are unemployed at this massive level, uh, millions and millions of them now are losing health care, health insurance, uh, and uh, that is obviously going to add, a, you know, a huge stress on the health care system as well as on the individuals uh, that are no longer going to feel like they are uh, able to, to get adequate coverage. So uh, that I think that if you want to talk about a benefit cliff, I think that is the uh, Grand Canyon of benefit cliffs. Mm. And what a time to be losing your health care. Clinicia, did you want to weigh in? Yeah. <laughs> um, so speaking from a nonprofit um, who works a nonprofit basically and as um, a unit director, so a supervisor, um, my goal is to when we reopen our doors in July is to just um, make sure that our employers are safe but also our kids because I, ha I do have to think about our, um, my employers um, that work here. Um, and there's a lot of families and I just want to reiterate the impact um, that a lot of organizations are making on our parents and our kids uh, for those that are open during these times. A lot of these parents that are coming to my doors are surviving a, a lot off those evening meals that we serve for our 18 and older kids. You know, for those parents that are returning to work um, that have to leave their kids at home, you know, with someone that's older, a teenager or so, who, you know, they might not know how to cook, right? So we're here to, to provide those evening meals um, we have survived a lot of um, donations from corporations and, and, and businesses and individuals that are just here to help us. Um, like I said, we're serving, you know, canned goods and not perishable items and things like that, just to ensure that our kids also are getting some type of academic success. You know, my, my, my team lead who's on the line right now, Miss Exasia, um, she created this art book for our kids. Mm -hmm. and also complete the requirements for our grants, but also be able to have something to do at home, you know, because not only are we serving our communities, food and gift cards and things like that, but we're also trying to uphold that mission to where we are an organization that focuses on academic success, healthy lifestyles, character and citizenship, things like that, because we can't forget those things, that our kids still need that. Um, so, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to play some sort of um, make sure that we are filling the shoes of our, our teachers a little bit right now, but also that supportive because um, I'm a parent. So giving that love as well um, and just being a resource for our parents. Um, also, I want to um, recognize the Summer Works program um, because we just got notification that we'll be able to give um, two of our teams out of each club the opportunity to um, be employed in the summer. That is a grant that's from, you know, the um, mayor's initiative for the summer works program. So, you know, that that's impactful because a lot of these kids our teenagers need to help their parents during these times to bring in extra income. A lot of non, I want to just say nonprofits because I've worked in nonprofits since I was old enough to work in nonprofits. Um, we thrive off people, you know, um, being able to partner and make resources available for our parents. It's a team effort. Um, so I just want to let that be known. Um, and also let it be known that I'm also nervous, as I've mentioned in the chat, because nine months out of the year, we're an after school program. So when you take away JCPS, you know, where does that leave us, being that we have things to fulfill to keep our doors open that's grant related? Um, we have to have a certain amount of kids in our building, you know, things like that. So I'm concerned um, in regards to that because I serve a vulnerable population. I am in the West End of Louisville. I serve nine, at least 95% of my kiddos and parents are African American. Um, I'm stationed in the low income community, you know, so taking, you know, I'm not speaking into an existence, but these are things I need to think about. If you close the doors of the Boys and Girls Club, where does that leave our families? You know, those connections could be lost. So 
So I just want to um, let that let that be known that um, it, it's a lot, you know. But us coming together and having these conversations are vital. So I appreciate you know letting us be able to work out some solutions. I get our parents and our kids and our organizations and and things hurt. So I appreciate that. But I did just want to say that. And I think Clay, I think Clanisha hit the nail on the head. And I think that's what we've all been thinking about the last couple of months is I know I, you know, homeschooled two children while working and we kind of did what we had to do to get by and to finish the school year. But really it's so much more that childcare and schools provide than just academics. I mean, it's all those essential skills of, of working together and teamwork and uh, having a schedule and interacting with other children and where you know, the Boys and Girls Club provides all those services that have not been able to be had the last couple of months. And so I think it's a much bigger issue than just the academic piece and making sure that your child, you know, completes whatever assignment they have for the day is that it really is a, making a well-rounded child and giving them, you know, what they need in every facet of their life, not just academics, but on mm -hmm. to kind of the benefit cliff issue. One thing that we at the chamber have advocated for for many years is really universal child care. Every, every child in Kentucky should be able to have access to quality child care um, and so you know we, we talk a lot about how to do that right like how do you how is it feasible how can we actually do that we think that the threshold for assistance based on income should just be raised that's a kind of an easier solution than public school having to do it when you also have parochial schools and private you know child care centers and wrapping your head around how to do this we think probably the threshold for that child care assistance should be raised and that's what we've advocated for many years and so maybe you know one good thing that could come out of this conversation when we're looking at how important child care is and yet it could be decimated here in Kentucky is that really making sure that we're investing in it um, and making it a priority and that we do kind of have a solution. We've worked with KYA and Pritchard and other groups on just raise the threshold. It's a pretty simple solution to hopefully get to your goal someday. So I think though that Clinician made the excellent point that it's way more than just babysitting and way more than just academics. It really is, you know, well-rounded children that we're talking about. Beautifully said, thank you to you both. Um, as we uh, kind of wrap up the conversation, the last thing I, I'd like to hear, and I know you, you all uh, touched on it a little bit earlier, but um, I think it's clear, you know, when we, that the solutions are gonna lie with some federal investment, state and federal investment. Um, and so I'm wondering, can you spell out for us what that needs to look like? Um, in terms of state and federal budget investments to support both families and businesses? So I have some numbers in front of me. I just had to look it up. So Kentucky has received 60, $67 million of the CARES Act to support our child care small business sector. Um, and so that has been very helpful. Obviously, and the employees also get the unemployment insurance benefits. But like we said earlier, there's still about half that will not make it through this. And so we have been really um, advocating strongly. I know you all have as well and trying to use as much reach within our networks as we have to continue to reach out to our members of Congress and to Leader McConnell um, to, to ask for more dollars. And I said, I know everyone kind of has, of course, their handout during this time and there's so many needs that need to be met. But I do think for such a critical uh, area, there absolutely needs to be more federal funding. So we work closely with the U.S. Chamber and other groups, uh, you all, Pritchard, et cetera, on asking for that additional dollars. And I do think it's important to have a diverse group asking for that and kind of showing the, the different reasons for importance of it. So again, I know that sounds like a simple answer, but just keep asking, keep being loud, keep writing your letters and whatever you need to do, social media. But that really is kind of, what's right in front of our face right now is asking for more federal assistance. Hmm. Bill? Okay. Uh, yes, that's exactly right, actually. Uh, and, and that's why, you know, right now, as I mentioned several times, was this HEROES Act, which is like about the third phase of our uh, special legislation to try and uh, support the economy and, and the working people of America. Uh, and uh, you all can join with me to, uh, you know, ask uh, Senator McConnell to uh, hear this bill and to, uh, you know, pass the, the, the legislation, uh, House Resolution uh, 6800, uh, 
the way it is. Uh, there's a, a huge amount of very uh, good elements to this uh, bill, and uh, some of it has to do with uh, supporting uh, child care agencies uh, to a higher degree than they were before. Uh, Health care issues are involved here. Uh, paid leave, uh, FMLA expansions. Uh, there's. Uh, I, I went through the uh, summary of the headings for the bill, and it was, you know, you know, voluminous, about 90 pages worth of stuff. Uh, huge uh, undertaking, which I think is, you know, extremely needed right now. Uh, so as I said earlier, you know, this uh, the pandemic and the uh, associated ills that are going along with it, uh, whether they be employee, employment related, health related or whatever, are not going, going to disappear any anytime soon. Uh, and, and this bill at least expands uh, coverage uh, uh, for for health care and other items out until at least December. Uh, so, you know, people are at least getting a little bit more of a cushion and uh, and see how things uh, progress as far as the, uh, the level of the infections go and, and whether or not, you know, things actually do improve. And uh, given what's, you know, going on right now, that is not very likely uh, in, the, in the short term. Uh, so I think if we were asking to do anything right now, uh, it would be right in front of us would be the, this uh, HR, House Resolution uh, 6800, the HEROES Act, uh, which does a lot of the things that the CARES Act did, but uh, expands it uh, to incorporate more availability for the, uh, for the loans and the, the PPP money and, and uh, other items that are really critical. So uh, if folks wanted to, you know, engage now, that would be one ask that could be made would, would be to, you know, urge Senator McConnell to uh, hear this uh, bill and, and, and get it passed so that uh, we can at least have a, a modicum of a level of, of security and support for working people uh, and businesses as well uh, during uh, this, this time uh, going forward here, at least till the end of the year. Thank you. Um, Klanisha, I want to give you the last word if you want to give us a final, um, as Terry would call it, a benediction. <laughs> uh, what, what's your call to action for the folks here today? Well, my call to action really is just to ensure that we are, as long as my doors are open, <laughs> just to ensure that a collaborative effort happens in regards to whether that be volunteers, whether that be peer mentors, whether that be donations, um, because I'm trying to look at all spectrum. Just because I, I serve kids <laughs> from the age of 18, 6 to 18 years of age, and I serve parents, um, I just want to ensure that the connections that I have remain, you know, regardless if we, you know, if COVID's over, like I've mentioned before, um, it just shows the need of the the need that parents really have. Thank, times like this actually show us that, wow, people are really struggling, you know? Um, and I just want to keep that, I want, I want to keep that, um, that open. You know, Ashley and Bill, I appreciate you all for being a voice um, on behalf of if families um, and kids and things of such. Um, and I just want to say that the the partnerships that I had that I have had, you know, JCPS, I do appreciate in regards to Chromebooks being able to be available to our kids um, and remain and, and be able to have for the remainder of the summer. Um, I did get an email stating that Chromebooks do not have to be sent back um, because of things that's happening in the summer, which to me is kind of indication that you know, I don't know if we'll be opening the doors. Um, that's how I look at it uh, for JCPS. But, um, you know, Dare to Care, um, uh, restaurants, big corporations, organizations, just donations. Um, I just want to keep that available for our families. So if we could just be um, universal <laughs> in the calls of helping our families. Any type of connection mm -hmm. we can make, even on this call, would be awesome. Um, so yes, I just want to say that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Harper Kelly uh, from KYA, who's going to uh, wrap us up. All you, Harper. All right. Thank you all so much. Um, again, I cannot thank our panelists, um, Ashley, Bill, and Clanisha. Um, as a uh, a parent of young adults now. Um, I've been, you know, I sit at home a lot and think, oh my goodness, thank goodness my children aren't 
little um, because I watched Jesse <laughs> during some of our, and, um, and actually we enjoy having little snippets of um, BJ, who is uh, Tina's little boy, and uh, Jesse, who's Nash's little boy, kind of join us sometimes. Um, and uh, there's a, but we still, I still have concerns about my young adults um, in this world right now. Um, and I have one who is un unemployed, two who were lucky to be lucky um, to be able to find online jobs that they can do from home. Um, but we have the access and the technology to make that happen. Um, and so, um, but we have a lot of young adults in our life that are really, really struggling right now. Um, and so, Bill, um, I want to thank you. Um, some of my reflections are that, you know, um, the idea that um, employers um, are aware, you know, obviously, but um, are more aware even of the backpack of concerns and issues that their employees are coming um, to work with, um, especially those who have been um, out of that job. Um, and you're getting a lot of, you'll have a lot of new applicants um, coming into the workforce too, uh, because uh, they're having, they were fired from their position or their jobs were closed down um, and unable to reopen. So I appreciate hearing um, all of that and the fact that um, some of the supports that are already out there um, that have been handed down by the federal government and, and our state um, has been um, helpful and sufficient and we certainly hope that those resources are continuing to be available when that's crisis as Clinicia said when the crisis starts slowing down we don't want to forget um, Ashley the whole idea about child care um, and when you said that they are way more than babysitting and education um, and and providing those very basic needs um, even now um, and they've been doing that for three months clothing shelter safety um, and, and that emotional place to go, um, as Clinicia was sharing with us. And Clinicia um, is a friend of mine. I've, I've been um, blessed to be able to have met her um, through, actually a start through Youth Build Louisville, um, where she was a caseworker, um, and now here um, as a unit director of a place that she used to go to when she was a youth. So she is a direct, um, product of the Boys and Girls Club of Shawnee. And so now she's leading it, which is pretty impressive um, in itself, and a mom of two young girls. Um, and so uh, I really appreciate you grounding us in the reality of being a parent. Also, the concerns that nonprofits uh, You're sharing with us those highlighted concerns that have always, but more of us as the public is experiencing it now. And so we just can't, we're, we can't push it under the rug anymore and ignore it. And I think a lot of us have been doing that. Um, but like the food insecurities, the safeties and the, dis, the safety forum um, and the discrimination that has been going on that's like hitting us in the face now. Um, thank you for reminding us that that collaborative effort continues and remains. And we just appreciate this conversation and you all being here to uh, remind us of a lot of these things. Um, so that's a call to act. Our company, along with the policy and practice changes, some big, some small, that can be a real difference maker for kids. As advocates, we're used, we're used to running marathons and preparing to rebuild from COVID along with addressing inequities. And that's going to require our toughest marathon yet. And this is why we're preparing now. Um, and so as you heard from Terry at the beginning of the forum, we have some predictions around an upcoming announcement and next week's forum with the new DCBS commissioner. So I won't say anything else on Terry's little teaser, but stay tuned as we'll be sharing that information soon. We'll follow up with an email to all of you that includes a recording of this forum, along with an RSVP form for next week's forum, an action alert about childcare investments, and more. So thank you all very much, and we'll see you next week, we hope. <laughs>